grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Certainly there was much about what Jesus did, what he said, that undoubtedly amazed the disciples and everybody that heard Jesus. Although the particular miracle we read about today, the feeding of the 5,000, clearly amazed the disciples uniquely. Other than the resurrection itself, this feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that all four gospel writers wrote about in their gospels. The resurrection and the feeding of the 5,000 are the two miracles they all made sure they included. And there's a lot of reasons why, scholars speculate, they made sure to include the feeding of the 5,000. But I've reduced it down to three reasons. There are many more, but three, I think, that are of important note as to why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John made sure you heard about Jesus' miracle of feeding the 5,000. And I think the first reason is the magnitude of the problem that was put before them. It says 5,000 men were fed that day, but really if you include women and children, which they would have implied by that, you're really talking more about fifteen to 20,000 people. Think about the CHI Stadium downtown, that seats 18,000 people. Fill that to the brim, and that's how many people we're talking about. So the magnitude of the problem certainly made this memorable in the disciples' minds, but also the magnitude of the solution. So many people to feed with such little food. So the magnitude of the problem contrasted with the magnitude of the solution. But also, I think, in looking back on this miracle, writing it to you in their Gospels, I think we can clearly see how it's here that the disciples truly start to understand who Jesus is and particularly how he would work in their life and how he desires to work in your life today. Let's start with the magnitude of the problem. To really understand what the disciples were facing, you have to go back and understand what was leading up to this. Just at the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus is rejected by his own hometown people. The people he grew up with. The people closest to him. And when we say he was rejected, we don't just mean laughed at or dismissed. Rejected means they literally tried to kill him by throwing him off a cliff. The, witness, the, the disciples witnessed that with their eyes. You have to let that sink in. They watched as Jesus' hometown people tried to murder him. And then right after that, Jesus says, Okay, disciples, now I'm sending you out to share the gospel with the world. And sends them to preach the same message. And tells them, some people will receive it. Others won't. And then, with all of this in their mind, we get this little piece we read about last week of John the Baptist and how they inserted this comment that John the Baptist was beheaded for preaching the good news himself. And you almost get the impression that this is looming in their minds as the disciples obey their Lord and share the good news with the world. Well, when they went out and they shared the good news... Apparently, they had some good success. It says in Mark 6, 12 through 13, that the disciples went out. They proclaimed that people should repent, as Jesus told them to. And they even cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick and healed them. Things seemed to be going pretty well for the disciples at that point. And so it says in verse 30 and 32 that they returned to Jesus and told him, all that they had done and taught. And Jesus said in response, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. So going into this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000s, the, the disciples have been on a roller coaster of emotions. They've seen Jesus almost murdered by his hometown people. Then they go out and they actually cast out demons themselves. They must have been on a high at that point. Wow, this is really working. This is great. 
And then they come back to tell Jesus, and this whole crowd is so crazy and stirred up, they can't even manage to eat lunch together. Up and down and up and down. And so Jesus asked them to come away to a desolate place. And you have to remember, they're going to a place with no food, no water, to a desolate place because that's where their Lord is taking them. On purpose. To teach them something something they all are going to remember and they're all going to make an appoint to tell you about in their Gospels. The magnitude of the problem starts to come into focus as Jesus says in verse 33, many saw them going and recognized them and they ran there on foot from all the towns, got there ahead of the disciples and when Jesus went ashore, he had compassion on them because this crowd was like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, the hour is now late. Send all these people away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Seems reasonable enough. I mean, what, do you really expect us to feed 20,000 people? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what Jesus says to them. You give them something to eat. Half a year's salary on average. That's how much money it would have cost if they were to buy food for all these people. Half a year's salary. Remember, this is where the Lord led them. They didn't wander here by themselves. Jesus told them, let's go over here to rest. John tells us in his gospel in John chapter 6, verse 6, that Jesus did this to test them. He himself knew what he was going to do. Jesus knew he was going to feed these people. But there was something he was doing in putting his disciples in this situation to teach them something that was eternally important. And you have to remember, Jesus put them in this situation. The magnitude of, sol of the solution starts to come into focus when we remember that. Such a big problem, feeding 20,000 people. Jesus solves with five pieces of bread and two fish. I mean, really, there was no fanfare. There wasn't a big scene. He just took the bread that they brought, took the fish, asked God to bless it, gave it back to his disciples, and it just kept coming. Memorable in all of the disciples' minds because of how such an enormous problem was solved so simply when they brought the little they had and entrusted it to him. Now we start to understand why this was so impressionable. What enormous problems do you have? And if you can't think of one, chances are one's coming. Take what little you have, even if it's next to nothing, and entrust it to the one who gave everything for you. This is why the disciples, I said, probably remembered this so clearly, because they began to understand not only who Jesus is as God Almighty, but how he wanted to work in their lives. You have to remember the disciples are writing this story looking back. Jesus has already died and risen and ascended to heaven. And then they're writing this to you who also like them live in a time when Jesus isn't here visibly. He's risen, ascended back into heaven. And so they're saying this is how he's going to work in your life too if you have ears to hear it. Jesus was coming to the end of his Galilean ministry and this, this, this miracle marks his journey starting to go to Jerusalem where he would give himself up entirely, where he would give his body as the bread of eternal life and that means his disciples would soon have to follow after him, that he would continue to shepherd people through them, that he would entrust his ministry to them, to you, his disciples. God was with them in Christ. And that's what he was trying to get them to focus on. They were focused on everything they didn't have. Not realizing yet 
who it was they did have, who was in their midst, and who was always going to be there with them. The same one who's with you. The same one who stands there with open arms and says, bring it all to me. What you can't do, he can. And what can we do? We can't even breathe without him. Everything comes from him. And I think that's one of the first lessons the disciples really learned that was so impactful looking back on this miracle, writing it in their gospels to you, is that everything, all, depends on Christ. It always has. You didn't choose to come into this world. You were simply given this gift of life. All depends on him. You have nothing apart from the Almighty. All good gifts come from him. All depends on Christ. The disciples tried to solve this problem at first by the work of their own hands. Lord, half a year's salary won't pay this. You're right, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm waiting for you to come to me. As I prepared for today's sermon, it reminded me of hymn number 732, All Depends on Our Possessing. Verses 1 and 2 say this, All depends on our possessing, God's abundant grace and blessing. Though all earthly wealth depart, they who trust with faith unshaken, by their God are not forsaken, and will keep a dauntless heart. He who to this day has fed me, and to many joys has led me, is and ever shall be mine. He who ever gently schools me, he who daily guides and rules me, will remain my help divine. All depends on Christ. Which means, the second lesson I'm sure they learned, is that there's nothing too big and there's nothing too small in the hands of Christ. The disciples couldn't fathom it. Lord, do you know how much it's going to take to feed these people? Yes, he did. Far less than you think. You see, I think we struggle with the same things as Christians. I think we're ready as believers to admit there's nothing too big for God. I think we're all okay with that thought. Where it becomes challenging is when we're asked to remember that there's nothing too small for him either. How many small things in our daily life do we go about doing thinking, I got this? Or maybe not even thinking about God. Maybe not even considering what small things he cares about in our lives. How you use your time. How you use your talents. How you use your treasure. I think the disciples learned that not only were they supposed to bring the little things to Jesus... But they were supposed to be faithful in the little things too. Because it's the little things that often yield the biggest result. The little things that reveal the almighty power of God. What little things can we be more intentional with? I don't know. How long do you think it takes to read three chapters in your Bible every day? Ten minutes if you read slow? Can you find 10 minutes? Just that little bit of time? How long does it say to say, to, to, take, to say one prayer to God every day? A minute? And even if you don't know what to pray for, can you, can you say, Lord, I love you. I want to pray more. I don't know what to pray for. Please teach me to pray. Amen. You see, the little things, that's where you're going to start to see the abundant power the abundant life God wants to give you. Five loaves and two fish in our hands doesn't feed anybody. Three nails and two pieces of wood in our hands doesn't build a home. But in his hands it builds eternity. I think ultimately... When we look at the feeding of the 5,000, we're reminded that life in Christ is and should be abundant. Life is abundant in Christ. And what I don't mean by that is, if you believe in Jesus, your bank account's going to be overflowing with money. 
and you're going to have a Corvette in the front yard and a three-story home. No, that's not the abundance Christ talks about. No, life in Christ is abundant because you have been forgiven more than you can count or measure, just as I have. Life is abundant in Christ because once again you're going to come up here and receive from his table and be able to taste and know it's so real that heaven is yours. You have the riches of eternity guaranteed for you in Christ. Life is abundant in Christ. And it should be abundant. And I don't think abundance means just you have more than you could ever want. I think the Lord was teaching his apostles what true abundance means. And I think we see that in the words of William Reinrich, a theologian from St. Louis. He says, when the fragments are fathered so none would perish, there was much left over, 12 baskets full. And this detail has nothing to do with the idea of abundance itself. The point is that the food given by Jesus remains so that it is available for future believers who may also partake in the feeding which Jesus gives. The perspective incorporates the future of the church. The disciples struggled with what they didn't have. Jesus calls them to be faithful with the little they do. Not only for their sake, but for the sake of their neighbor, their brother and sister in Christ. How do we apply this to our life today? Do you know the national average of those in the church who tithe is less than 30%? Less than 30%. That means 70% or more give nothing. You have something, even if it's a quarter. Or is that too small in your mind for the Almighty God to use? God calls us to look at what we do have. And if it's not money, maybe your time. How can you give of yourself to someone else in need? Something small like a smile, a ride, a meal. You want to see the abundant life and power of God? Jesus says, what do you got? Give it to me. One of my favorite theologians, Ilva Sacher, says this, the disciples had to learn to turn from human impotence of both mind and ability and turn first to the almighty power of the Lord. Jesus was teaching them that they only have him to rely on completely and not themselves. In order to be truly satisfied, they would receive of his fullness and receive in order to possess what they would be sent out to give to those who without their ministry might perish in the empty barren wilderness of their earthly existence. Life in Christ is abundant. You have been abundantly forgiven for eternity. You have the abundance of heaven waiting for you. And it's in that abundance that God says, I want to show you even more here. And that starts with taking even the little or the much that I have given you and putting it in his hands and trusting yourself to the one who had everything and gave it up abundantly for you. Amen.